This is another quotation. We are not interested in reforming the prevailing institutions of the police, armed services, judiciary and monarchy, through which the ruling classes keep us in our place. We are about dismantling them and replacing them with our own machinery of class rule. Our aim is to replace the present leadership with people prepared to fight for the working class and fight for real power. Wherever possible, we should work for all black shortlists and all women shortlists so that the issues can be thrashed out on the basis of class politics alone. Now, now I, I hope that the... Well, I, I'm going to invite the uh, honourable gentleman to say uh, whether or not he can join with me in condemning that yeah, sort of attitude yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, what I can join with the House in doing, including many honourable members on the other side, is condemning this despicable parody of a response yeah. to a very serious debate in this House. We know that this debate is not simply about the political fate of one Secretary of State for Defence, or the political future of a trade and industry secretary, let alone a Prime Minister. It's not simply about the contents of this letter, although circumstances force us to consider that carefully. It's not just about the relationship between government and private industry, although that does raise some cause for concern. It's not just about the ultimate destination of the control and ownership of one of Britain's important defence contractors, important though that is. The importance of this debate is that the Westland Affair provides us with the clearest possible, most graphically illustrated, most thoroughly documented demonstration of how this government has sacrificed and continues to sacrifice public interest to its ideological obsessions yeah. with market forces. About a third of them are from men. The vast majority of whom agree with me. I received, of course, some obscene letters from men, and I think Mr Murdoch and those who are shouting opposite should know that those are the kind of people who support and defend their page three. I, one example, Mr Deputy Speaker, the letters were predominantly from women and they were predominantly from young women who stressed time and again that they didn't consider themselves to be prudes, but they objected very strongly indeed to these letters. One, for example, was from a young woman who worked in an office and was writing on behalf of a number of young women who said they considered themselves to be young and attractive, but each day they were subjected to men in the office who, when reading the papers, tittered and laughed and made rude remarks like, show us your page threes then. They felt strongly that this bill should be passed. I think members opposite display their attitudes for everyone to see and will be judged accordingly. The President assured me that the operation would be limited to clearly defined targets related to terrorism and that the risk of collateral damage would be minimised. He made it clear that use of the F-111 aircraft from bases in the United Kingdom was essential because by virtue of their special characteristics they would provide the safest means of achieving particular <coughs> objectives with the lowest possible risk both of civilian casualties in Libya and of casualties among United States service personnel. Mr. Speaker, terrorism is a scourge of the modern age. Libya has been behind much of it and was planning more. The United Kingdom itself has suffered from Libya's actions. So have many of our friends, including several in the Arab world. The United States, after trying other means, has now sought by limited military action to induce the Libyan regime to desist from terrorism. That is in the British interest. It is why the government supports the United States action. Yeah. If the President of the United States should again present the Prime Minister with such a fait accompli and say that he will go ahead, whatever her opinion, what will be her response then? 
I have already answered the right honourable gentleman's question. If only they would listen. Yeah. Speaker. The Prime Minister has not answered that question. What she, what she is now trying to claim is that she has somehow mitigated the nature and the effects of the American raid. Isn't it the case that she has now moved into the worst of all worlds, demonstrating both complicity and impotence? What the right honourable gentleman is seeking to do is to help the terrorists by knowing exactly what answer. By knowing exactly what answer we should give to a request. I have already said to him that, request, that if a request were received, we should have to consider it in the light of the circumstances of that time. But if that is his view, if that is his view of those whom he represents in the union, he won't be, he won't be thanked very much. He won't be thanked very much the next time he goes to a union branch meeting. I've never heard such a disgraceful criticism of, of workers in a union as the honourable gentleman has. Order, 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 order. Mr. Secretary Ridley. Keep his temper as well as can't get his facts right. He's got real trouble back at home. Uh, I want to tell. Order, order, order. I don't think we want any anger of this kind in a statement like this. Will it, will it? Order. The Honourable Gentleman would draw that word, hypocrite, please. Mr. Speaker, when we're talking about further sit down, he's just asked me to withdraw, hasn't he? Yeah. If we're talking about further redundancies in an industry which both myself and my father used to work, I will not be sneered at by an old Etonian twerk like the right honourable yeah. gentleman. Order. Order. I ask the honourable gentleman to withdraw the word hypocrite, please. Purely out of deference to you, Mr. Speaker, I will withdraw. To say that the Prime Minister did not take part in the leak is a sustained, brazen deception, straightforward dishonesty. And the House of Commons can't continue to operate on this basis. Truthfulness in this place is the fulcrum of our system. Mm. This Prime Minister is a sustained, brazen deceiver, now hiding behind cynical performances. Order, 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 order. The Honourable Gentleman knows that he can't say that and he must withdraw that remark about the Prime Minister. I say that she is a bounder, a liar, a deceiver, a cheat, and a crook. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, order, 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 uh, order, order. And the honourable gentleman, he, he knows perfectly well that he can't say that. And he must either withdraw it or I must invoke the powers that are vested in me and the responsibilities that I have. Now, I very much hope that the honourable gentleman, who is a very experienced parliamentarian, will withdraw the remarks that he's made. I don't want to take up the time of my colleagues. Let's carry this no further. I stick to it, and I know what you have to do. In those circumstances, I have no alternative but to exercise the powers vested in me under Standing Order Number 24 and order the Honourable Gentleman to withdraw from the House for the remainder of this day's sitting. In the United Kingdom, it's estimated that about 30,000 people are infected with the virus. They are carriers capable of transmitting the virus. It is not known how many carriers will eventually contract the disease themselves and die, but the proportion is relatively high. So far, it is 25 to 30 percent, but it may be more. So those are the key factors. The AIDS disease is fatal and incurable. The virus is infectious in certain specific ways, principally through sexual intercourse uh, and also by drug abusers sharing needles and there is a long incubation period. AIDS then is a long-term problem, and I think that this point has to be emphasized. It is not a problem that will disappear in the next six months or so. The likelihood is that it is a problem for at least the next 10 years, probably for the rest of the century. The number of AIDS cases is inevitably going to increase whatever we do, because even if no one else became infected from tomorrow, there are still the estimated 30,000 carriers, many of whom will eventually develop the disease. Mr Speaker, if we accept the motion or the amendment, I think we should be placing the Commons 
and members of parliament forever under the effective control of government in that ministers could bring a, an injunction, the court that could uh, accede to the injunction, and, and nobody would wish it less than you, Mr. Speaker, that you would become an agent of the minister with his injunction and the court that upheld it to enforce upon members the denial of the rights for which we were elected. And I cannot believe, knowing you, Mr. Speaker, that it would be your wish to be remembered as a counter Lenthal whose protection did not extend to the members in this position. Now, may I just say one last word as an old member of the House. We all take children and visitors round this House. I do and have done for many years. And we tell them that we keep Black Rod out. We tell them about the Outlawry's Bill, that the House decides on its own business before it gives attention to the gracious speech. We tell them about the Army Annual Act and the order to prevent a standing order being held. We tell them about the five members. But you know, these are not meaningless rituals. Yeah, yeah. They are reminders of yeah, yeah. monumental struggles yeah, yeah. to build democracy against tyranny. And it is important that we should not treat these as just tourist attractions. It is clear from the location chosen for the bomb and the absence of any warning that those responsible for this monstrous act set out deliberately to kill and maim ordinary members of the public. People from both communities who had come together on a Sunday morning, young and old, like thousands upon thousands of others throughout the United Kingdom, to honor the memories of those who have died in two world wars and since. In all the tragedy of the terrorist campaign, this outrage stands out in its awfulness to per per perpetrate such an outrage against people, for many of whom the occasion was already one of sorrow and remembrance betrays a total lack of any human feeling yeah. nor nor could there have been a more deliberately provocative act more calculated to stir up sectarian hatred than this outrage on this special and solemn day did the prime minister really mean it when she said two weeks ago I'm absolutely delighted that people always want to see me. And if she did, why is she opposed to the idea of allowing the British people to have the chance to see her on television in this house? Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, my concern is quite simply this. My concern is for the good reputation of this house. Very much so. Very much so. Order. Order. I do not think television will ever televise this house. If they do televise it, they will only televise a televised house, which will be quite different from the House of Commons we've known. Mr. Speaker, when for centuries we've had this place reported, when the public come into the gallery, when for ten years we've had it broadcast, what reasonable cause can be given for not using modern technology for order. 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 What reasonable cause, Mr. Speaker, can be given for not providing reporting and broadcasting of this House with moving pictures. What is the Prime Minister afraid of? Yes, Mr. Speaker, but the Right Honourable Gentleman really gives me my point. The reputation of this House has not been enhanced by sound broadcasting. Shortly before 1pm yesterday afternoon, one of those subsequently shot brought a white Renault car into Gibraltar and was seen to park it in the area where the band for the guard mounting ceremony assembles. Before leaving the car, he was seen to spend some time making adjustments in the vehicle. An hour and a half later, the two others subsequently shot were seen to enter Gibraltar on foot, and shortly before 3 p.m., 
joined the third terrorist in the town. Their presence and actions near the parked Renault car gave rise to strong suspicion that it contained a bomb, which appeared to be corroborated by a rapid technical examination of the car. About 3.30 p.m., all three left the scene and started to walk back towards the border. On their way towards the border, they were challenged by the security forces. When challenged, they made movements which led the military personnel operating in support of the Gibraltar police to conclude that their own lives and the lives of others were under threat. In the light of this response, they were shot. Those killed were subsequently found not to have been carrying arms. The parked Renault car was subsequently dealt with by a military bomb disposal team. It has now been established that it did not contain an explosive device. As somebody who's always opposed terrorism, whether it is the IRA or anyone else, and still condemns terrorism, and who would, of course, like everybody else in this house, been absolutely affronted if people had been destroyed and killed in Gibraltar. Can he explain why those three people, who, although accepted as active service units of the IRA, were killed and shot when it was admitted they did not have guns on them or they had not actually planted a planted a any bombs in Gibraltar. Could he explain why that happened? And how can this actually help us in the fight against terrorism? Won't that help terrorism? I'm afraid that the Honourable Gentleman uh, must stand almost alone in the House in offering that point of view. So far from reversing the 1987 budget tax reductions, I propose to take this, the first opportunity since the general election, to fulfil our manifesto pledge. Yeah. The basic rate of income tax for 1988-89 will be 25 pence in the pound. Yeah. The small company's rate of corporation tax will similarly be reduced to 25%. This means that the basic rate of income tax and the corporation tax rate for small companies will both be at their lowest level since the war. Life assurance premium relief remains in place. a personal statement. I must order, well, I must say to the Honourable Member, the order, if the Honourable Gentleman does not now make his statement, I shall be forced to take other action. Please. Court. And I court, Mr. Speaker. I wish, I wish to make a personal statement, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Gentleman is making his personal statement. Regard to the mace, I don't know who he is, and I apologise and I apologise and assembly to you, Mr Speaker. And to the House and what occurred, I accept responsibility for any damage that was sustained by the mace. Now I don't write this rubbish, but you know it. say that I cannot accept that as a personal statement for the honourable member. And order, I order, I must, uh, order, I must ask the honourable gentleman now to leave the chamber while I consider carefully what further action I shall have to take on this matter. 
Is the Prime Minister aware I've had a letter from a, a widow in my constituency in the beautiful village of Selston in Ashfield? Is she aware before the April the 11th she was receiving housing benefit? She's now being told she's no longer entitled to housing benefit and she's struggling to find food to eat. I hope that's gone home. I believe because of the policies of this government and this Prime Minister, it's a wicked woman and a wicked government that does this kind of thing. So he didn't know how to divide the money up. And he wanted to be fair. He wanted to be fair, not only to his honourable friends on the back benches, but he wanted to be fair to the Liberals and the Social Democrats. He didn't know how. And he's been puzzling ever, ever since. He's come up with a solution here. He could have done with Pythagoras, quite frankly. <laughs> I mean, it's not the brightest solution of all time. What he's asking us to do is pass retrospective legislation. <laughs> He's wanting us to say that we don't know they've merged. <laughs> He's wanting us to put a, a blindfold on and say that there aren't two parties, one down at that end and one up here. He's wanting us to admit that the right honourable gentleman that's gone for a personality transplant, where is he? <laughs> doesn't exist and has never been leader or joint leader or whatever. He's wanting us to wipe all that out of our memory and I can't. <laughs> it's ultra virus. <laughs> if this went before a local authority, so except Westminster, <laughs> People would be surcharged if they passed it. <laughs> we have now got to refer to them in terms of getting money as the Liberal Alliance or the SDP Alliance for money, but not for anything else. <laughs> oh, mind you, it does say one thing in here and it's caused a, it'll cause a problem. It says that from now on that they've got to be called SLD. Now, some of the Liberals don't like that. Some of them are saying, I'm a Liberal, and they put it on the ballot papers in local government elections. Some of them say, I'm a Social Democrat, and they put that on. In the last set of local government elections in May, I did a count, there may have been more, there were seven different varieties. It's called the Heinz Party, or will be shortly. But under this, under this, the Tory government have named them. So when they stand in the next election, I hope you're listening, <laughs> you've got to have this title, or otherwise no you're in trouble. No yes, you've got a dog's dinner here, Mr. Leader of the House. <laughs> you've tried to make a seven-course dinner out of a pan of boiling water. <laughs> and you've failed. The House will wish to join me in an expression of deeply felt grief at this tragedy. It is, it is already clear that the loss of life is greater than in any air accident that has previously taken place in the United Kingdom. And as yet, we have little indication of the extent of the losses among the people of the Lockerbie area. May I also express on behalf of the Government, and I'm sure the House, our deepest sympathy with the American people and our great admiration of the emergency services who served us so well last night. Yeah. Search and rescue and support helicopters, aircraft and mountain rescue teams were involved, as well as ground support medical and search teams from service units from all over the country. Their work is still going on at the site of the crash and in the surrounding areas and will continue for so long as is required. Our thoughts today and throughout Christmas will be with those whose relatives and friends died there last night. I'm Prescott. Mr Speaker, on behalf of the opposition, I offer our deepest sympathies to the relatives and friends of all those died in last night's terrible tragedy. Last night in Lockerbie, we saw a nightmare come true. All of us feel a deep sense of shock. Under the heading, Regional Troubleshooters, the Prime Minister held back from declaring a full state of emergency last night. 
Instead, the government is setting up regional emergency committees. Is that the Honourable Gentleman's regional policy? <laughs> Apparently, they will not have the power themselves to order the use of troops. That, at least, is to stay with the government. Grocers may close as stocks dwindle. Walkout hits water supplies. Water supplies and sewerage services covering three quarters of a million people in Lancashire will be hit by an unofficial strike. There was an emergency on the same day. There was an emergency ten years ago today, that golden age, there was an emergency declared in Ulster. British Railways pilots were on strike. But those are not the main headlines. Those are the secondary stories. <laughs> this, is the, uh, this is the main headline. The nation is on a precipice, says Healy. <laughs> Union spurns cabinet plea. Lorry strike made official. Food stocks will run out. That, that is the record of the golden age, the Honourable Gentleman Rice. The media were interpreting your statement of December the 3rd as saying that most eggs were infected. That was a misinterpretation according to you of what you intended to say. Why didn't you correct them on December the 6th? Why didn't you say that they had got it wrong? They were misinterpreting your statement. Chairman, is this an inquiry into what I said on December the 6th or an inquiry into salmonella in eggs? It's, it's an inquiry into the government's handling of the whole salmonella uh, business. I, I think we might, we might leave that particular point. Uh, uh, we have on asked the contrary, it. Chairman, I think it's absolutely vital. I mean, one of the profoundest uh, mysteries behind this is um, the question of the kind of messages that the government was giving out to the world at large. One message that was apparently picked up by the world at large, according to the media, was a message from you as minister that most eggs in this country were infected. And one of the mysteries, if that is not what you intended to say, is why didn't you correct that misinterpretation? Chairman, I know what I said. I think everybody knows what I said. In an attempt to assist the committee... I clarified what I said in my letter to you of the 25th of January. I do not have to comment on anything I did not say. And as for people who perhaps might have picked up the wrong end of the stick, that is a matter for them and not for me. The Chancellor of the Exchequer on this occasion has proved himself to be a very wise man, in my judgment, a very wise man. He is not a far-seeing man, that we must admit. <laughs> because he... Uh, and he hasn't got a sense of humour. He is. <laughs> well, he will agree that he didn't uh, foresee in his last budget that his surplus was going to be four or five times that which he calculated. Uh, he is not a very well-informed Chancellor. And the reason for that is that... Uh, the Prime Minister's campaign against the worthless bureaucracy has so affected the statistical department of the Treasury that very often they don't really know what's going on. But he is wise. And the reason I say he's wise is uh, that he has got himself and the country into a position in which he doesn't know what to do, and he has therefore very wisely decided to do nothing. <laughs> And it may be for that. It may be for that we ought to be grateful. <coughs> As he knows, he is my favourite one-club golfer. And uh, on the last occasion, he made a splendid drive from the tee. Enormous reductions in taxation was widely hailed. Now he finds himself in a bunker and is discovering how difficult it is to get yourself out of a bunker with the wooden club with which you drove off. <laughs> And therefore, all I ask is that he should now reconsider his bag of clubs and perhaps uh, embrace a few more in order to deal with this particular situation. Mr. Speaker, no one, however long they have held the post, likely gives up the great office of Chancellor of the Exchequer. Certainly, 
I did not. And as the resignation letter, which I wrote to my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, clearly implies, it was not the outcome I sought, but it is one that I accept without rancour, despite what might be described as the hard landing involved. <laughs> I would only add that the article written by my right honourable friend's former economic adviser was of significance only in as much as it represented the tip of a singularly ill-concealed iceberg with all the destructive potential that icebergs possess. I have always voted against the televising of the proceedings of this House. Yeah. Yeah. And I expect and I expect that I always will. Yeah. Yeah. The brief intervention of the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Bradford South, did nothing to alter my view. Yeah. <laughs> despite, the, despite the strongly held opinions which I have on these matters, I received a letter three weeks ago I believe that a copy was sent to each of us, and possibly even to you, Mr. Speaker, which made the following preposterous assertion, and I quote, the impression you make on television depends mainly on your image, 55%, with your voice and body language accounting for 38% of your impact. Only 7% depends on what you are actually saying. <laughs> I, thought that I, I thought that I should enlist the sympathy of the opposition with that last proposition. <laughs> the letter went on. And you may think that this was an extravagant claim, so far as myself is concerned, but the letter went on. We can guarantee to improve your appearance. <laughs> <laughs> Through a personal and confidential image consultation, you will learn if you need a new hairstyle. <laughs> and where to get it, <laughs> and the type of glasses to suit your face. <laughs> the House will understand why I consider that I was beyond redemption <laughs> on all counts. There has been much talk tonight in this chamber of the passage of time. I was but a child on the day when I opened the door to my father on his return. He stood there, grey and drawn, and said to me, do not touch me, I am covered with lice. Everyone in the camps are covered with lice. We have been de very many times, but I am still covered in lice. He did not sleep for very many weeks. He could not. He had nightmares for very many years. And it is said that Mrs. Mavis Tate, in fact, never got over what she saw in the camp, for she died a number of years later. He spoke to myself, to my brothers, and to my sisters of what he had seen in the camp. He told us of the hanging gibbets, where human beings were put on hooks and hung under their chins until they died. He told us of the lampshades that were made in the camp, where people in charge of the camp rather liked tattoos, and where they skinned people and used that skin to make lampshades. They had discovered that when they died, the skin was given to shrinking too quickly, so they tried skinning them when they were alive. He showed me photographs of bodies, piles of bodies piled high on carts. Three weeks later, 
The Allies had not had time to remove them all. He showed me photographs of men in thin, thin clothes. Photographs of skeletons. Photographs of men with haunted eyes. And I will remember always the look in those men's eyes. The look of complete, utter bewilderment and incomprehension. They had starved, they had been beaten, and yet their spirit was still there. I might also say, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the arts lobby at the time, and the member for Stoke-on-Trent in particular, were delighted by this grant, and the minister was praised tremendously for his efforts. But let me uh, ask a couple of questions, because my honourable friend who's not here now, the member for Twickenham, said... I beg your pardon. <laughs> said he, the, the, the arts contribute to the quality of life. Well, I wonder if he one day can explain to me how the arts' contribution to the quality of life has an effect on my pensioners yeah. and my ordinary people who want to yeah. buy a pint in a pub and find it to do Their quality of life is not enhanced by seeing some man prance about in a box or listening to the different range of an opera singer. And the other question I'd like to ask, and nobody answers this, certainly not the great and the good sitting opposite me, is what is art, what is culture, and, what, and who defines it? The answer to those questions are personal ones. What I do know is who the hell pays for it. And it's the, it's the ordinary chap down the street. He's the one who pays for most of it, while the great and the good take advantage. I'm sorry that the Honourable Member for Hayes and Harlington is not in his place because listening to him opining upon the arts is rather like listening to Vlad the Impaler present Blue Peter. But I can tell you this, that he is undoubtedly, he is undoubtedly living proof that a pig's bladder on a stick can be elected as a member of Parliament. <laughs> it's a, I think... Well, uh, well, oh. well, I know, it's not unparliamentary, it's not really very nice. I just... I just, it's, it's, it's artistic, Mr. Speaker, it's artistic. And I'm just sorry that the Honourable Member is not here to actually hear it, but I don't want to uh, uh, offend you, sir.